The only thing I want in life is to be known for loving Christ, to build His church, to love His bride, and make His name known far and wide. For this cause I live, for this cause.
and then sodomy. And uh, please bless this service, Lord, and all who attend, and bless those who aren't here. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 We're going to change it. We're going to turn to 57. We're going to hymn number 57, and we're going to sing at Calvary, hymn number 57, at Calvary.
least of you. Uh, is there anybody tonight who's ready to do their verse? Anybody, any takers? Brother Ken. Luke 14.23 And the Lord said unto the servant, Go, in, go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. Yeah. All right, anybody else who's ready to do their verse tonight? Anybody at all? All right, well, let's grab our Bibles, and uh, we'll go over to Luke 14, uh, 23. And again, as is our custom here, we do the reference, we'll do the verse, and, and uh, we'll say that reference one more time. Uh, to help, uh, hopefully, through all of these memorizations, at least, whether you remember the verse or not, um, which I hopefully you are, uh, those verse references start to stick in. And uh, when you're talking to people, the Holy Spirit will use that to, uh, to bring to mind where you can go and minister to people. So uh, Luke 14, 23, we'll say the reference, we'll say the verse, and then we'll say the reference one more time. Here we go, church. Ready? Luke 14, 23. And the Lord said unto the servants, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. Um, so keep working on that. Our member this week is uh, Carl Castillo, so uh, continue to pray for him uh, with uh, his age and, and heart illness. He's been kind of staying away um, physically, but I've uh, been talking to him about every week, every other week or so, uh, praying with him and just kind of catching up with him. And so uh, so pray for our brother Carl, um, and I know he'd greatly appreciate that. And then our missionary this week is uh, the Lighthouse Children's Home. And so pray for, uh, um, my mind, my, my, Ron, Ron and Tara Black, and uh, of course the orphan girls we support. Now, uh, it, it landed perfectly because every November uh, I send extra money for Christmas uh, for them. And what we usually do is uh, we send $100 per child and then $100 for the host family down there. So it'd be about $400 that we're gonna send extra down there. So if you wanna be a part of that, uh, just uh, right on your tithing envelope, and this is for the Christmas offering for uh, for the girls uh, in Mexico City. And uh, Edith, Rosa, and Ros uh, Rosita, Edith, and Floor, uh, those three girls. And so, uh, but we always try to do that every year. We, we've sent packages down to them, but uh, it's a little bit more cumbersome trying to get them across the border. So we found out it's a lot easier just to, to send donations to Lighthouse Children's Home, and then they'll be able to disperse it and be able to, uh, to buy that. So so please be aware of that. Again, if you want to be a, uh, involved in that, um, again, we're going to send it out. I, I don't, I, I love to let you send it out. If you want to be a part of it, we'll apply it to it. But uh, really, I'm just doing it. I believe God wants us to do it, so we go ahead and do that. Uh, just like this week, we also got notice that Walter Stevens, uh, his ministry, uh, he, they started a new ministry in Pakistan, and they have been meeting in a building. Now, he's not over there. He's doing it virtually. And hasn't been able to get over there because of all of the COVID stuff and the restrictions. But they've been able to get a church up and running and a building secure over there. And the uh, the owner of the building wants to sell the building. So they're basically uh, asking these, this group to leave now. Or they can buy the building. And so the, the building is $47,000. And so they're raising money for that. And so I committed $500 that, this week as well uh, to do that. They're trying to get 90 or so people, 94 people I think it is. For 97 people to uh, to donate at least $500 or more, and they can uh, secure that uh, that building. So, just want you to know those are things that are going on. We have missionaries that have needs. Uh, we often just uh, I've told the church for all 16 years we've been here, ever since we've been doing missions work, uh, that is the heartbeat of God's work. And if we have to go without here to take care of our missionaries, uh, I believe that's what, we, what God will bless in our in our church. Amen. And so we've always done that. So. Um, we used to put all the missionaries on the back of our uh, of our uh, bulletin, so some of you aren't aware, uh, maybe, and, and we're, we're looking at trying to move some stuff around um, to get more prominence on missions, but we currently support 25 different missions works, either locally or around the world, and so we praise the Lord for that, and uh, you look around, and that's almost one group probably for everybody that's here tonight, and uh, that's that's remarkable that uh, God has allowed us to be uh, to do that and be a part of that. And, uh, and trust me, there's many more beating the door down to get in every door, uh, every church. Uh, probably at least one a week that's, uh, uh, you know, calls, trying to get in. Um, we're not keeping people out. 
we just don't want, I don't want to waste their time coming knowing that we're you know, not in a position to do that right now. But God will let us know and it's time to move forward on some more uh, with that. But uh, so just be aware of that. So if you want to give a little bit extra for the project with Walter Stevens, again, just designate on your tie down below a Walter Stevens uh, additional or a building, and we'll make sure that, that, that it gets over to Brother Walter uh, and get that taken care of. And be praying about that, obviously. They have a certain amount of time. I think they have until December to, uh, to be able to raise the money. So the, at least the owner has been very gracious to them giving some time to do that. So maybe you can do more than that. Maybe you can give $1,000 or more. Again, just designate it, and 100% of that will go to Brother Stevens and for that obtaining of that building. And so, uh, so be aware of that, okay? Um, and I think I'll certainly be praying about uh, the election coming up. Uh, I'm kind of excited. Friday, um, there's a conference call that I'm going to be on with uh, a lot of preachers and the governor. And so um, it's, it's a great opportunity. I'm making a laundry list of questions, not that I'll get to ask them, but uh, we will have some question and answer opportunities as well. Um, so we'll see, uh, see if we can pick his brain about where he's at and try to influence him for, for, in a good way uh, with that. So you'd be praying about that. I'm sure there's going to be hundreds of preachers on there, so, uh, but be, uh, be praying about that. Because I, I don't like the way it's headed right now. <laughs> I mentioned the other day about the governor. Just, just be on guard. Uh, he has made it absolutely clear that uh, things are probably going to happen because all of these uh, supposed numbers are going up higher and those type of things. And you know, unfortunately, if you're like me and, and maybe it's my shallowness, uh, I have a hard time believing a lot of the stuff that you hear about. Amen. Um, and so you just, you just gotta, um, you know, trust the Lord. I was reading this week in, uh, in my devotions. Uh, I think it was in Psalm that said, some trust in chariots and some trust in horses, but safety is of the Lord. Yes. And that's where our trust is. So, you know, we know God's at work. He's doing some great things. Uh, we know the devil's at work. We know that he's at work. And he knows, uh, you know, I can't imagine what the tribulation is going to be like when, when he knows he's got about a short time. I mean, he doesn't know that yet because uh, the, the, the rapture hasn't happened yet. And so, but he's still creating a lot of havoc and, and, and wreaking a lot of havoc. And, uh, you know, he's got a lot of people working for him. But don't ever forget, I heard a preacher say this uh, a long time ago. You know, sometimes we get so focused on all the devils that are doing all the work. But remember, only one-third of them fell. Two-thirds of them are still doing God's building. Just don't forget that. So, uh, and, and we're on the winning side, amen? amen. And, uh, and so, but we certainly need to be praying for our nation uh, in this time of great division. Um, and the only thing that will unify this country is the Lord Jesus Christ, the truth, that's it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was thinking this week, I thought, how do you reconcile half the population who thinks that they have a constitutional right to kill babies mm -hmm. yes. against those who be believe in a constitutional right that says the baby has freedom and has rights? Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you reconcile those two as a nation? Okay. It's going to be cataclysmic to uh, reconcile this. It's going to, it takes the truth and, uh, and the acknowledging of the truth, which is repentance. And it's going to take a national repentance. It's going to take half the people uh, to come to the point where they realize, regardless of the Constitution, by the way, I hope you know, the final rule of practice for my life is not the United States Constitution. It's this Bible. Uh, but I do believe in a responsibility to uphold the Constitution uh, as an American and try to, to, to live by it and hold others accountable to it as well. And so, uh, but I just, it's something we need to pray about. I mean, a divided nation cannot stand, the Bible says. Right. It just cannot stand. And so, how do you stop it from being divided? The truth. Right. And the truth right. shall make you free. You, you, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. If you lose liberty, what's that mean? The Spirit of the Lord is not there. And, uh, and so I, I tell you, I've never, in my life, you've probably heard this a lot, in my life, I've never seen such a clear, uh, concise uh, avenue to go for this election season. I mean, it is black and white this year. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if you're confused and you're a little gray, I, I encourage you, I'll talk to you after the service. I'm available. I'll be glad to. Get your nose in the Bible. That'll get you straightened out on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, it straightened me out on abortion after I got saved. I didn't understand the argument. Then I came across a verse that says, God hates those that shed the hands that shed innocent blood. Right. And I said, oh my word, that's, that's uh, talking about baby killers. And, uh, and so we've been against it ever since, right? 
but it's all in there. Everything's in there. Everything that's going on right now is against God. you got to understand that. Psalm chapter 2 being fleshed out right before us. So you can be part of the solution. You can be part of the problem. Um, but I think if we're right with God, we'll know what the right side to be on. Uh, and I think it's pretty clear this year uh, to do that. And, and we need uh, we need every vote. I mean, who knows what's going to go on. But this I know. God's still in control no matter what happens. Amen. And uh, uh, again, I said this the other day, we deserve whatever we get. Right. Um, and, and that's, we can't get around that. But we can thrive no matter what's going on. Right. Um, Paul lived under a king, one of the vile kings, <laughs> many of the vile kings. In fact, one of them took uh, his head off, uh, Nero, and they were still able to preach the gospel. And they were still, you know, sometimes persecution is what uh, fosters the word of God as it goes forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, though we don't look for it, don't want to go through it, um, it may be there. And so I've said this before, and I keep saying it again. Great peace have they that love thy law, nothing shall offend them. So regardless of how the election, I'm praying for a certain outcome, I'm telling you. I think it's been pretty clear who I support and and uh, and, and why you should support them. Um, but then again, if you want to talk after, I'll be glad to do it. But, uh, but regardless of who wins, I'm going to pick this Bible up on November 4th. I'm going to do my devotions. Um, I'm going to come to church. We got church that night, by the way. Oh, yeah. November, November 4th. Uh, we'll be here at the church house. Yeah. We'll be preaching what we're preaching. Yeah. And uh, we're, we're going to pray. We're going to sing songs. We're going to do all those things. And, uh, and we'll go home. And then guess what? We're going to gather on Saturday and go out on the streets and knock some doors. And, uh, and Sunday we're going to have church. And we're just going to keep going on yeah. uh, until the Lord comes. That's what we're Praise called God. to do. Praise and so I, I hope that you'll be a part of that and be with us uh, with that. Okay? Well, let's, uh, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. And ask the Lord's blessing. Father, we thank you for this time that uh, you've given us and afforded us to be here tonight. Thank you for those who have chosen to be here, Lord. They could have chosen to be anywhere else, but Lord, you compelled them to come in tonight. You you called them to come in here tonight because, Lord, you you have something for them tonight. And they have something for us as, as a church body gathering, Lord, to complement and help one another. And uh, Lord, I thank you for what you're going to accomplish, what you've already accomplished here tonight. Lord, thank you for all of our faithful members. And Lord, we're praying for Brother Castile. We know he'd be here every Sunday morning, Lord, as he always did. Uh, but ever since his heart problem, he's a little leery, be a little older. Uh, Lord, that's, uh, we're praying for him tonight. And Lord, I know he's still got some struggles and some breathing issues and everything. Uh, but I pray for him tonight. I, I pray you'll encourage him and strengthen him uh, and help him uh, right now. And Lord, we pray for Lighthouse. Uh, children's home, and, and not just the work in Mexico City, but all over the world as they have homes all over the place and children that are being reached for the cause of Christ and, and nurtured and cared for and with physical needs and spiritual needs. And we pray for them and we thank you for Ron and Tara Black who are now the executive directors. We uh, pray, Lord, for uh, wisdom for them as you continue to uh, work through them and for them. And thank you, Lord, for allowing us to partner with them all these years. And we, uh, we just thank you for that. Now, Lord, as we, uh, as we enter into this time of Bible study, I pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts, teach us. May all of us, uh, may even right now, utter a simple prayer, Lord, speak to my heart tonight. And the Lord, show us uh, what we need to learn tonight for, uh, for us to be better ministers of the gospel. Uh, better Christians, Lord, that represent you. Lord, we pray for our nation. Uh, Lord, I, part of me is so hopeful because I know that uh, you're still on the throne and your will will be accomplished. Mm. But Lord, as an American, it breaks my heart to see where we're at, see the divisiveness and, and just the anger and animosity to where we really can't even have conversations uh, with people who disagree with you anymore. Uh, but Lord, um, please forgive us as a nation. We have, we have walked away from you so many times. And, uh, as Nehemiah prayed, not only for the forgiveness of his sins, but for his father's sins and his father's father's sins. Lord, this nation has turned its back on you for many, many years. It's amazing you've been so gracious to allow us to even see the light of day this far. But Lord, it just shows us and reminds us how long suffering you are. And so if there's one here tonight that's been running from you or thinking about running or wandering, Lord, I pray that you would uh, show them your grace and mercy once again here tonight and that they would uh, repent and 
and turn back to thee, Lord, and realize uh, the blessed life that you have for them. Now, Lord, if there is anyone here who's not saved, we certainly pray for their salvation most of all. But thank you, Lord, for what you're going to accomplish, what you're going to do tonight. And we pray your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, Scott, we wait so long. Scott, we wait so graciously. If you need a handout, raise your hand if you need a, a handout. Uh, anybody need a handout at all? Uh, no, Wayne, did you have something? Uh, so you yeah. Um, I want to ask for a prayer for Rosemary Sun because he called today. Okay. And... Uh, all of a sudden, uh, he couldn't. He was coming down to see Rosemary. He couldn't come, and he parks at the end of a street. Yeah. And somebody just hit his car, and he don't know who it is, and smashed the whole rear end up and pushed it all the way to the back of the door. And I don't yeah. know, it might be demolished. Yeah. And he needs prayer. You know, maybe he can come with justice. Maybe they can find the person. Yeah. Or whatever. Can okay. Was that at the that West Fleet that happened? No, no. Oh, at the house? Yeah, I Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's pray for him right now. Father, we want to pray right now uh, for Chuck and the situation here, Lord. I pray you will use this to awaken him spiritually further yeah. than you already have, Lord. Uh, we know nothing happens by accidents. There's no coincidences, Lord. Uh, uh, but, Lord, we uh, I just pray for him right now, and I pray that um, your will gets accomplished in this matter, and that uh, he'll turn to you right now. And Lord, we do pray that whoever did this uh, would own up to it and take care of it. And, oh, Lord, I know even recent days of my own life that's happened, and people have owned up to it and taken responsibility for it. So, Lord, I pray you put on the heart of that one, whoever did it, uh, Lord, to uh, to take care of that. So, Lord, we uh, just thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Yeah. Amen. Amen. It happened to me, brother, just about a month ago, a month and a half ago. Somebody hit me in the, uh, in the parking lot <coughs> across the street. Uh, and I was in here all day. I went out, and, uh, and I saw a yellow note on my my front windshield and they had their name and their number and said call me we're going to take care of that and they did they took care yeah. of everything so uh, it didn't happen too much in fact the body shop was amazed and they said you got the information i'm like yeah they took care of it and so uh, so there are some people that still take responsibility out there in accountability and i hope you're one of them amen, amen. so uh, as well all right we're going to look at a couple of things tonight i want to talk about we've been focused on soul winning and uh, certainly this will go along with with soul winning um, that we're going to talk about the gospel tonight. But we're going to look at Romans chapter 1. Uh, and then we're also going to just peek over at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter, fi uh, chapter 15. So if you want to go over there as well. Um, you know, today the word gospel is, um, I'll be honest, it, it's been very perverted. We know it was already being perverted uh, back in the time of the writings of these books. But... Uh, you know, you go up to the average person today and ask them what the gospel is. I asked somebody that question yesterday. I said, what's the gospel? And you'd be, I wish I had a tape recorder. I'd play it for you tonight. Uh, it, it didn't make any sense. I just sat there and, you know, I, was, I was, had the privilege of talking uh, to a woman. And, you know, she was of a completely different belief structure. And I said, well, what if I came to you? And I said, you know, what must I do to be saved? Or what, what, what would you tell me the gospel is? And, um, and this is what they said, my testimony. Huh. Your testimony is not the gospel. Amen. Right. The gospel stands by itself. Now, I hope you have a gospel testimony. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. I mean, that's very important to have a gospel testimony. But we need to understand what the gospel is um, and its importance to God. All right? You say, what's important to me? It should be important to you. Mm -hmm. It should be important to me. Mm -hmm. But I think if we understand the importance it is to God, it just might help us to focus a whole lot more on the gospel. You know, as a young man, all I wanted to do was please my father. Humanly speaking. I just wanted to please my dad. It was very, very important to me for my dad to be pleased with, with, with what I did. It was very important. And you know, I, what, you know what I've noticed in life? That doesn't necessarily go away. Um, you kind of always want your dad to be proud of you. You always kind of want your dad to, to, uh, to, to be pleased or favorable with what you're doing. Now take that into the spiritual realm and say, you know, our Father, which art in heaven. Well, we should know what our Father wants so we can do what our Father wants us to do so 
our Father will be pleased with us. Amen. So we got to know what's important to our Father. Amen. You know, I learned what was important to my Father and what was important to me, especially growing up, and you probably did as well. When you focused on what was important to you than what was important to your Father, depending on what it was, it often ended in a chastening time. <laughs> right? Because you wanted to do what you wanted to do, but Dad wanted you to do uh, you to do what he wanted to do. And you learn about the importance of what Dad wants, right? So how much more should we want to learn about what's important to God? That's why I've titled this message this way, The Gospel and Its Importance to God. We want to know uh, how important is it to God? Uh, what does the Bible say about it being important to God? And then, so you and I can have a greater appreciation for it and a greater consumption of it in our lives. Mm. You're struggling with sin, I can tell you right now, you need more of the gospel. Amen. Because if you implemented the gospel, you would die to yourself daily, like Paul said. And uh, you wouldn't struggle as much with that. So we're going to look at the gospel and its importance. And I want to start actually in 1 Corinthians 15 and then we'll go to Romans 1. But 1 Corinthians 15, uh, Paul, this is a great chapter uh, on, on the resurrection uh, and, and, and starting with the gospel. Okay. Amen. But Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. So he's about to tell them, I'm declaring unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. Now, mind you, here's what he's saying. Yeah, this is the same thing I told you last time I was with you. <laughs> it, this is what I preached. Nothing's changed with this, but i got to declare it unto you again, uh, because obviously we know Corinth was really struggling in his area about living the gospel, which brought into question their belief of the gospel. You know, they go hand in hand. If somebody's having trouble living the gospel... You have to question, do they really believe the gospel? Because when you believe the gospel, as we're going to look at here and remind ourselves, that's all spiritual. The whole thing's spiritual. And we get sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. So if someone's not living the gospel, it brings into question, have they really believed the gospel? That doesn't mean they haven't. So let me say that. But it actually brings it into question whether they have. It says, the, the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received. And wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless you have believed in me. See what he says? It brings into question the sincerity of your belief about the gospel. For I delivered unto you first of all, which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That's an important phrase there, church. According to the scriptures. The scriptures are the final authority, the measuring tape. And what he's saying was, this is the same one I preached to you before. This is the same one you received. The same one you stand in. The same one that saved me and saved you. It's the same one. And here it is. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And then he was buried, and then he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Amen. So he lays out for you what the Gospel is. This is what he's declaring for you. This is what we declare to people. That Jesus Christ died for our sins. Amen. And then he was buried, and then he rose again the third day. And how do we know that? It's according to the Scriptures. Amen. So when we go out and declare the Gospel, that's what we're declaring. And that's what we're... And by the way, it goes on to validate this Gospel by the witnesses that saw Jesus and testified of the, the apostles, first Peter, then the apostles, then over 500 brethren at one time who all saw Jesus there. And he goes on and talks about faith and, and uh, in the Lord and if we only have hope in this life... We are men most miserable, those type of things. But I wanted to focus in there on the gospel. And again, it should be a this should be a reminder for us. Amen. I mean, if you're if you're sitting here tonight, like, wow, this is incredible, this is deep, this is something new. Boy, we got some other issues we got to take care of. Amen. You know, this is milk. Okay, this is not meat. This is not strong meat. This is milk. 
the milk of the word, we should all understand the gospel. If you don't understand the gospel, I don't know how you're saved. Because Jesus died for our sins, he was buried, he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. Now, why is that important? Romans chapter 1. And Paul alluded to this as well in 1 Corinthians 15. But Romans chapter 1, which by the way, is all about the gospel of God. In fact, I did my thesis on Romans chapter 1, and the title of my thesis was, The Gospel of God. Because it's all about the gospel. In fact, verse number one, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God. And then the next few verses to, to describe more in detail about that gospel. But just for sake of time, we're not going to go through all that tonight. I want to jump over to uh, verse uh, 14. Paul says this, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. And here he is. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He says, I'm not ashamed of what I'm about to tell you. I'm not ashamed when I come there. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I have no shame in telling you exactly that Jesus Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again. And here's why there's no shame in telling the gospel of Jesus Christ, because it is the power of God unto salvation. Amen. And what he says is, your salvation is more important than me being ashamed of something. Amen. And so, he says the, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. The gospel is of the utmost importance. You know, there's a lot of things you can talk about on, uh, about with different people. And you know, sometimes you got to talk through those things to get to the gospel. And you know, God, if we're, if we're spirit-led, we'll know when it's time to infuse those things in there. We'll know when it's time that God has kind of flipped the switch and it went from a lot of maybe a, a small talk or physical things into the, uh, into the eternal. Like we looked at uh, a few weeks ago, the, the Samaritan woman uh, went from, well, okay, here's this water. Well, yeah, if you knew the water I'd give you, man, I'll give you water springing up unto everlasting life. And he takes it from the physical to the, to the spiritual. He takes it from the temporal to the eternal. And so, but the, the thrust of soul winning is to get the gospel out. That's the main message. That Jesus died for our sins according to the, according to the scriptures. That he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That ought to be the thrust of our ministries. Amen? Amen. Why? Because that's the power of God unto salvation. That's what's going to save somebody. Amen. And so as we look at the gospel, there's five things I want to bring out to you about the gospel. Number one, the gospel, on your handout, the gospel is the means of our salvation from God. It's the means. It's the catalyst. It's what produces salvation. And we already quoted that verse with the fill in the blank, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. If you hold your place here in Romans, uh, or Romans, why actually you don't even have to hold your place. Uh, go to Ephesians chapter number 1. Ephesians chapter number 1 kind of goes along with this. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, I think you will uh, start in verse number 12. Ephesians 1, 12. It says that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance and so the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of His glory. I go through great verses. Amen. You're talking about eternal security, right? There's eternal security, my friends. You are sealed under the day of redemption. You say, well, when's the day of redemption? Well, 
the, the Gospel of Luke says it's the return of Christ. Amen. So how long are you saved? Until Jesus comes. Amen? Amen? Don't get excited about that or anything. You know, nothing to scream about or hallelujah to the Lord about or anything. You know, that, you know, you're going to heaven for all of eternity. You know, no sin, no sorrow, no death. I mean, yeah. really, don't get excited. I mean, we get more excited when the Browns uh, score a touchdown, right? Because uh, it happens so little. Um, it, it's so it's such an anomaly. You know, that's how you know 2020 is really messed up. They have a winning record right now. It's crazy. You know, who knows what's going on? But uh, they came back. 2020's mellow, mellowing out. They got crushed by the Steelers. So, but uh, anyway, the, the the gospel. We'll transition back to the gospel here. The gospel is the means. It's the gospel of our salvation. What's the gospel of our salvation? What is the power of God unto salvation? The word of truth. Amen. See how it always comes back to the word of God. Amen. It always comes back to the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Amen. And there was a name written on his thigh that said, The Word of God. It's all about the Word of God. It's all about it. The Gospel according to the Scriptures, right? The Gospel is the means of of our salvation. Number two, it's the motivation for our sacrifice. It's the motivation for our sacrifice. Paul says this, I am debtor. You know, you get yourself in debt, debt is a great motivator to keep working. Amen? Amen? I mean, for certain sections of our population. The government, it don't matter, they just rack it up, right? But when you get debt, it keeps you motivated. I got to keep working because I got to pay my bills. And you feel a sense of obligation because you are indebted to that person that loaned you that money or loaned you that whatever, and you feel indebted to them. Well, the Bible says, Paul says, I am debtor now. Man, I've been saved by the grace of God. I've been cleansed. I've been purified. And now I feel indebted to go out and tell everybody that I'm saved and that there is hope for them. Amen. It's motivation. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, number 9. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. See what Paul writes here. 1 Corinthians uh, number 9, verse 16. 1 Corinthians 9, 16. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. What is my reward then? Verily that, when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not the, my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I may gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law of Christ, to Christ. That I may gain them that are without the law. To the weak became I as weak, that I may gain the weak. I have made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And here it is, verse 23. And this I do for the gospel's sake. Mm -hmm. See, the gospel is a great motivator mm -hmm. for your sacrifice. Mark 8, 35 says, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's, the same shall save it. Luke 14, 27, And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Remember, Jesus died for our sins. Where did he die? On a cross. Why is the picture of being a disciple? To deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. Jesus was saying in his own words, Live the gospel, and you'll be my disciple. Live the gospel. Now, what's the gospel? He died according to our sins. Uh, 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 died for our sins according to the scriptures. 
He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. He says, if you don't do that, you can't be my disciple. Now who's he talking to? He's talking to believers there. You know, I know some have taken up issue with the, the, the distinction I make sometimes between a believer and a Christian. Here's a, here's a perfect verse that tells you there's a difference. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to choose to be a disciple of Christ. Mm. You have to choose to deny yourself. You have to choose to take up your cross and follow Christ. Sadly, not every believer does that. And just because they don't do that doesn't mean they're not saved, but it does mean they're not a disciple of Christ. I mean, it's pretty simple. If two people are going in different directions and they both call themselves Christians, um, something's not right. Amen. 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 Something, and, and if you think there is, there's something wrong with you. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's illogical. To see things going in two different directions and say, yeah, they're both the same thing. Mm -hmm. You better go get your head checked. Mm -hmm. Literally. That's, that, that's how insane it is. To, to even say that. So... It's the motivation for our sacrifice. The cross of what he bore on that cross was our sin. Even more personally, my sin and your sin. Right. And it gives you a great motivation to say, you know what, I'm going to do this for Christ. It's the motivation for our sacrifice. Number three, it's the method by which we are sanctified. It's the method by which we are sanctified. What does sanctification mean? Two things. It makes us, you know, sets us apart to be holy. I, I say it this way. Uh, in, in this particular case, the gospel is the method which we are sanctified, which way we are made to fulfill our purpose. You know, God sets you apart for His purpose. It's not that He just sets you apart. The whole idea of sanctification is you now have purpose. You now have a divine a purpose for your life that God has separated you for. And so the gospel is what separates you uh, or, or the method by which you're sanctified, but you're made to fulfill your purpose. The second thing it does, it, it makes us look like Jesus. That's what the gospel does. It makes us, remember, we're being changed from one glory to another. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. 2 Corinthians chapter number 3, verse number 18. The Bible says, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So what that means is, when we see the glory of God, the Holy Spirit is trying to change us to reflect that glory. It's what Paul says in the book of Ephesians. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Put off the old man and his deeds, and put on the new man which is renewed in righteousness. What's he saying? Be changed into the glory of God. You and I are being changed from the glory of man into the glory of God. Now we don't have time to go through it all, but you'll find out 1 Corinthians chapter 3, surprise, is talking about the Word of God. And the more we spend time in the Word of God, the more we study it, the more we read it, the more we apply it, the more we believe it, the more we live it, we are changing from the old glory into the new glory, which is the glory of God. That's how we do it. Acts 20, 24 says this, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry, which I received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. This is where the grace comes in. We all know the verses. You should know these verses well now. I've quoted them so many times in, in Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So a grace that does not teach us how to be more holy is not the grace of God. 
even if they put grace in the name of their church. Even if they say, oh, oh, well, we're focused on grace. If your life's not becoming more holy, you're not focusing on grace. Right. That's what the Bible says. And so, um, so it teaches us, um, it's the method by which we're sanctified. That's why Peter said, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It's the method by which we're sanctified. Peter said, be ye holy, for I am holy. That's what Jesus said. It's the method by which we fulfill our purpose. It's the method by which we are made to look like Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says this, But by the grace of God I am what I am. And His grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I. But the grace of God, which was with me. See, it's the grace of God that works in us. By the way, the Bible says in the last days that uh, false teachers were going to creep into... God, among God's people. And they were going to turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. You can read it for yourself. It's in the book of Jude. I think it's the fourth verse, third or fourth verse. They turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. Now, if you're like me, you sit there and go, all right, well, what's lasciviousness then? Well, it's licentiousness. And you're going, okay, we're not getting anywhere, preacher. What's licentiousness? It's basically loose living. Uh, living without standards. Living without morals. Living without uh, boundaries. Uh, giving a license to sin. That's licentiousness. So watch this. If we preach the wrong grace and don't preach against the ungodliness... And the wickedness, we're actually giving license to it. Sure. You understand that? Mm -hmm. You know, grace teaches us that denying our godliness and worldly lust. If I do not teach you and me about denying our godliness and worldly lust, and I say, you know what? You're free in Christ, man. You can do whatever you want to do. Bless God, you're on your way to heaven. And it doesn't matter. That's not the grace of God. Right. And the Bible says in the last days, there are going to be a lot of people like that. You know anybody like that? I know lots of people that way. Try to talk to them about standards. Oh, you're one of those legalist churches. Right. They show their ignorance. They don't even know what legalism is. Has anybody ever heard this preacher, not, not in a serious tone, maybe joking, I don't know, but in a serious tone, anybody standing in this pulpit or this preacher ever say that you have to do something and add something uh, to grace to be saved? You never heard that. Legalism is adding works to salvation. That you've got to do something in order to be saved. That you've got to keep the legal law in order to be saved. That's not what we preach. That's not what we teach. We've never taught that. We've never preached that. Notice, when somebody calls you a legalist, what they're saying is, oh, you've got high standards. Amen. Praise God. Amen. <laughs> we ought to shoot for high standards. Amen. Amen. We, we ought to, we're representing the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ. But that's what they mean when they call you a legalist. That's what they're saying. Oh, you're one of those guys that, you know, you've got to dress a certain way. and You've got to, you, you can't do this and you can't do that. Well, yeah, if God said we can't do it, we can't do it. That's right. And, and if God even teaches the principle, we, we don't do it. Amen? What does it say don't do drugs in the Bible? <laughs> I think it's pretty clear you shouldn't be doing drugs, amen? amen. I mean, it's, it's, it, there's, there's, they're maybe not clear cut in that way, but when you put your body as the temple, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, you got to real uh, look at yourself in the mirror and say, am I glorifying God in my body and in my spirit? Amen. Because if the grace of God is working, when I look into that mirror, I'm seeing more and more of Christ in me. And I've told stories over the years of people that, you know, tattoos, piercings, all kinds of different things, hairstyles, and all of a sudden they get saved. Man, those things are by the wayside. Man, they come in, they're clean cut, they're dressed up. Man, they're covering up stuff. They're, they're getting rid of stuff. And man, it's exciting. 
That's when you know revival is taking place. That's when you see it's going on. You know what's happening? The grace of God is working in that person's life, sanctifying them to make them more like Jesus. Amen. That's how you know the grace is working. And praise God, we've seen it so many times in this church. And I praise God for that. So there's a method by which we're sanctified. Number four, it's the manner through which we serve. It's the manner through which we serve. 1 Corinthians 9.14 says, Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Now, in context, what Paul is writing here is about um, preachers, missionaries, evangelists, depending on God for their sustenance. And whether it's through a church or through love offerings, through givings of the people, however it is, that's, that's what the primary thing is supposed to be. It's just living in the gospel. It doesn't mean guys can't go out and work. I know plenty of preachers work jobs, do those things. In fact, uh, I heard one preacher in Agri, I looked down at a man who won't go look, work a job if, uh, if they're hurting that bad. I've uh, done it myself three or four times. I don't know how many times I've had to go back to work here and uh, no complaints about it. Just did what we got to do, whether it was for the family or for the church. You do it. And, uh, and you keep preaching, you keep moving forward. That's the manner by which you serve. Why? Because it's the death, the burial, and resurrection. I'm dying to myself. And uh, you're dying to yourself. You live in the gospel. Romans 1 9, for God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. We serve through the Spirit. That's what 2 Corinthians 3 is all about the ministration of the Spirit which comes through the Word of God. See, in the Old Testament, it was the ministration of the law. And he says, you know, the ministration of the law is glorious. Because God's Word is glorious, and the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Yeah. But he says, how much more is the New Testament, that we're ministers of the New Testament, how much more is the ministration of the Spirit, where their Spirit is, there is liberty. There's no liberty under the law. There's liberty through the Spirit of God. He says it's the manner through which we serve. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I love this in verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Now watch this. He's about to tell you what it means to die to yourself and manifest the life of Christ in your life. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed. We're not in despair. Persecuted. Oh, we're not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. What well, says? Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Why? That the life of G also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Say, what does that mean? Well, here's what it means. See, when Jesus was troubled, he wasn't distressed. When Jesus was perplexed, he didn't have any despair. When Jesus uh, would have been persecuted, he wasn't forsaken by his father. When he was cast down, he wasn't destroyed. He didn't let the circumstances overwhelm him. What he did was, he exampled what the life was. What Paul's saying here is, man, we're being persecuted, we're being attacked, we're, we're being you know, threatened, we're being stoned to death, left for dead. We're, all of these things says, you know what though? We are willing to endure it if the life of Christ can be seen. You know, suffering for the Christian is a good thing church. Now, I don't know. I'm not a prophet. I don't claim to be a prophet. I don't claim to see you off into the distance. I have opinions just like you have opinions. I listen to people who have opinions who I think have a whole lot more factual information behind it than I do, and I decide who I'm going to listen to and who I'm going to believe. And, and a lot of commentators today are saying, get ready for something coming after the election. And there may, depending on who wins, there will be suffering Two churches. There already is. And it has nothing to do with the election, at least at this point. We'll find out. <laughs> so, suffering is 
an attribute of being a Christian. But we do it through the spirit of the gospel of his son. In Galatians, he says this, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Always in his body. What does that mean? He was always conscious of the fact that wherever he went, he was representing the gospel. Wherever he was, he wanted people to see the life of Christ through his suffering, through his choices, because he knew the gospel was so important to the Heavenly Father. Now there's one last one. Let me give it to you quickly. The gospel is the main target of Satan's corruption. Yes. It's the main target. Why? Because it's the power of God into salvation. <laughs> that's, that's it. That's why. That's why he hates it. That's why he's trying to deceive people. That's why he gets people to think you have to work your way to heaven. Or you have to be good enough to go to heaven. Or you've got to follow this. Or you've got to do this. And you've got to do this. Uh, that's why he does that, because he wants to confuse. 2 Corinthians 4.34 says, but if our gospel be hidden, let's look at this real quick. We've got a few minutes here. Let me show this to you, because this is really neat when you get a hold of this. He says here in verse uh, 3, but if our gospel be hid, we're in 2 Corinthians 4, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Now, this is kind of neat, if you get a hold of this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, I already alluded to, it's a talk about the ministration of the law versus the ministration of the Spirit. So what's he talking about being blinded? What's he talking about, lest the light of the glory of the gospel? Well, this goes along with chapter 3. So let's look at this, verse number 13. Of chapter 3. And not as Moses would put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day when Moses is read the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, what turns to the Lord? The heart. When the heart turns to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. How does the veil get taken away? Through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. You know what that means? That means in the Old Testament, the gospel was found. Amen. But they didn't have faith. It didn't mix with the word of God, so they didn't have faith. And they had the veil. And the veil's still there today. The Jews today are still veiled. They don't see Jesus Christ. They still see the, the law and trying to keep the law. And they, they think it's through the keeping of the law. But one day, praise God, the, the blinders are going to come off. I think it, uh, it talks about that in, in Romans chapter 11. That God's going to peel the blinders off. And they're going to get to see it really was Christ. Some it'll be too late. They'll find out it was too late uh, when they get into uh, eternity already. But what's that? It's the veil. It's the same veil today that you and I, when we go door knocking and we talk to people who are Catholic or Mormon or Jehovah Witness or whatever other religion, there's a veil that's there. And the only thing that can take that veil away is Christ. And the gospel, the glorious gospel, it says in verse number 4 of chapter 4, the glorious gospel of Christ. Galatians 1, 6, and 7 says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. And how does that happen? I put three things down. Through distraction, through distortion of God's word, and through dilution of the truth. You know, there's plenty of deceivers that are out there right now. If you're not careful, especially with the expansion of the internet, there are a lot of guys out there that are preaching false gospel. Yes. I'm talking independent, quote unquote, independent fundamental Baptist preachers. There's a guy in Phoenix, Arizona named Stephen Anderson that preaches a false gospel. He preaches no repentance. You don't need to repent. He's got churches all over America now. 
I'm telling you, the guy's a false teacher. Mm. And understand that. Oh, he's very eccentric. He's very in your face. He's very uh, boisterous. And people like that. He's very confrontational. But he's wrong. Mm. Be careful who you listen to. Right. Be careful who you lend your ear to. Right. Because you will choose an authority at some point. I guarantee you listen to somebody on the radio or on television or wherever. Um, you'll find something that disagrees with your church. Because not everybody's the same. Now, some are inconsequential. Some are big deals. You know, someone starts preaching a post-tribulation rapture or a post-tribulation resurrection, I wouldn't even give a time of day. He's missed some of the milk of the word. You know, they start preaching no repentance, just believe the gospel. Well, what's the whole death all about? So I'm just supposed to just overlook that Jesus died for my sins? Well, I'm supposed to acknowledge my sins. I'm supposed to say those are my sins that he died for. Lord, please forgive me. That's called repentance. I'm acknowledging the truth that Jesus died for my sins. Amen. Yeah. And I believe that you're, He rose from the dead and, and I believe He's God and I believe it. And God will save you right there. Yeah. Because you believe the gospel. Yeah. Satan's got a lot of people out there right now. And I'm not talking politically, although there's plenty out there too on both sides. Yeah. But I'm talking about in churches. I'm convinced in Lakewood there's a lot of devils in pulpits every Sunday morning in this city preaching a false gospel, preaching a social gospel, preaching a secular gospel, preaching a spiritualist gospel, not spiritual gospel. Be careful. So how do I know? It's easy. Turn them off and read your Bible. And you'll get the truth. Except if it's Friday 1 o'clock. <laughs> now, that guy's a nut ball too. So. The gospel. Guys, it ought to consume us. Oh, there's a lot to learn in this Bible. We ought to study it. We ought to love it. We ought to want it. And you know what happens when you find out something new? Don't you want to share it with somebody? Mm -hmm. But just remember, when you're at work, or you're at school, or you're at a family reunion, the most important thing is the gospel. I think I shared this story before, and I'll close Somebody asked me, we were on a visitation one day over here by the Fedor Mansion and somebody was sitting outside and, uh, and I walked by and said, I'd like to invite you to church. And, uh, and they said, well, you answer a question for me first. Are you Republican or are you a Democrat? <laughs> I said, sir, I'm a Biblicist not just like to invite you to church. He says, oh, that means you're a Republican. That's what he said. I said, well, I'm glad you recognize that but I'd still like to, I'd still like to invite you to church. Because that's what's most important. Amen. God doesn't care if you're a Democrat or a Republican. He cares if you're saved or you're lost. Amen. Right. Right. Those other things are important in, to us as Americans. But not as important as the gospel. Amen. Remember, we're, we're supposed to do what's important to God. Amen. And preaching the gospel and living the gospel is important to our Father. Amen. And we ought to <coughs> strive to please Him. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. The gospel and its importance to God. I hope it's important to you. I hope it becomes more important to you. I hope that it becomes a consumption of your life to pray for divine appointments that God will give you so you can share the gospel. Say, will God do that? Prove them and see. Prove them. And watch what he does. But be prepared. Paul said, I am ready. Are you ready to preach the gospel? Maybe we don't get a lot of divine appointments because we're not ready to preach the gospel. Maybe we, some of us need to get ready to preach the gospel. And say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God and the salvation, first for the Jew and also for the Greek. Father, I pray that you'll bless this invitation time now. Lord, I, I uh, leave it in, obviously, in your hands of what you're dealing with in people's hearts tonight. Uh, Lord, certainly we talked about a lot of different things, but Lord, may you put it upon our hearts. Maybe some need to come tonight. They're not really living the gospel, Lord, and I pray that you will, uh, you will help them and make uh, conscious decisions, Lord, and conscientious decisions to lay down some things that are hindering their walk. 
And Lord, I pray that you'll bless. Now, if there's somebody here who's not saved, may they come tonight as well in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. I want to invite you to come. Maybe God has spoken to your heart about a need in your life. Why don't you come? Maybe there's some things you just want to come and pray about. There's some things that you're struggling with. You come tonight. You need to be saved. You come tonight. Oh 